Agreeable to his own appointment, on the evening he was committed to prison, with permission of the jailer, I visited Nat on Tuesday, the 1st of November, when, without being questioned at all, he commenced his narrative in the following words. Sir, you have asked me to give a history of the motives which induced me to undertake the late insurrection, as you, as you call, call it. To do, to do so, so, I must, I must go, go back, back to, to the days, days of my infancy and even before I was born. I was 31 years of age, the 2nd of October last, and born the property of Benjamin Turner of this county. In my childhood, a circumstance occurred which made an indelible impression on my mind and laid the groundwork of that enthusiasm which has terminated so fatally to many, both black and white, and for which I am about to atone at the gallows. It is here necessary to relate this circumstance trifling as it may seem. It was the commencement of that belief which has grown with time, and even now, sir, in this dungeon, helpless and forsaken as I am, I cannot divest myself of. Being at play with other children when three or four years old, I was telling them something which my mother overhearing said it had happened before I was born. I stuck to my story, however, and related some things which went, in her opinion, to confirm it. Others called on were greatly astonished, knowing that these things had happened and caused them to say in my hearing, I surely would be a prophet, as the Lord had shown me things that had happened before my birth. And my father and mother strengthened me in this, my first impression, saying in my presence, I was intended for some great purpose, which they had always thought from certain marks on my head and breast. My grandmother, who was very religious and to whom I was much attached, my master, who belonged to the church, and other religious persons who visited the house and whom I often saw at prayers, noticing the singularity of my manners, I suppose, and my uncommon intelligence for a child, remarked I had too much sense to be raised, and if I was, I would never be of any service to anyone as a slave. To a mind like mine, restless, inquisitive, and observant of everything that was passing, it is easy to suppose that religion was the subject to which it would be directed, and although this subject principally occupied my thoughts, there was nothing that I saw or heard of to which my attention was not directed. The manner in which I learned to read and write not only had great influence on my own mind, as I acquired it with the most perfect ease, so much that I have no recollection or whatever of learning the alphabet, but to the astonishment of the family, one day when a book was shown me to keep me from crying, I began spelling the names of the different objects. This was a source of wonder to all in the neighborhood, particularly the blacks. And this learning was constantly improved at all opportunities. When I got large enough to go to work, while employed, I was reflecting on many things that would present themselves to my imagination. And whenever an opportunity occurred of looking at a book when the school children were getting their lessons, I would find many things that the fertility of my own imagination had depicted to me before. All my time, not devoted to my master's service, was spent either in prayer or in making experiments in casting different things in molds made of earth, in attempting to make paper, gunpowder, and many other experiments that although I could not perfect, yet convinced me of its practicability if I had the means. I was not addicted to stealing in my youth, nor have ever been. Yet such was the confidence of the Negroes in the neighborhood, even at this early period of my life, in my superior judgment, that they would often carry me with them when they were going on any roguery to plan for them. Growing up among them with this confidence in my superior judgment, and when this, in their opinions, was perfected by divine inspiration, 
from the circumstances already alluded to in my infancy, and which belief was ever afterwards zealously inculcated by the austerity of my life and manners, which became the subject of remark by white and black, having soon discovered to be great, I must appear so, and therefore studiously avoided mixing in society, and wrapped myself in mystery, devoting my time to fasting and prayer. By this time, having arrived to man's estate and hearing the scriptures commented on at meetings, I was struck with that particular passage which says, Seek ye the kingdom of heaven, and all things shall be added unto you. I reflected much on this passage and prayed daily for light on this subject. As I was praying one day at my plow, the Spirit spoke to me, saying, Seek ye the kingdom of heaven, and all things shall be added unto you. What do you mean by the Spirit? The Spirit that spoke to the prophets in former days. And I was greatly astonished, and for two years prayed continually whenever my duty would permit. And then, again, I had the same revelation which fully confirmed me in the impression that I was ordained for some great purpose in the hands of the Almighty. Several years rolled around, in which many events occurred to strengthen me in this, my belief. At this time, I reverted in my mind to the remarks made of me in my childhood, and the things that had been shown me, and as it had been said of me in my childhood by those by whom I had been taught to pray, both white and black, and in whom I had the greatest confidence that I had too much sense to be raised, and if I was, I would never be of any use as a slave. Now, finding that I had arrived to man's estate and was a slave, and these revelations being known to me, I began to direct my attention to this great object, to fulfill the purpose for which, by this time, I felt assured I was intended. Knowing the influence I had obtained over the minds of my fellow servants, not by the means of conjuring and such like tricks, for to them I always spoke of such things with contempt, but by the communion of the Spirit, whose revelation I often communicated to them, and they believed and said my wisdom came from God. I now began to prepare them for my purpose by telling them something was about to happen that would terminate in fulfilling the great promise that had been made to me. About this time I was placed under an overseer from whom I ran away. And after remaining in the woods thirty days I returned to the astonishment of the Negroes on the plantation who thought I had made my escape to some other part of the country, as my father had done before. But the reason of my return was that the Spirit appeared to me and said I had my wishes directed to the things of this world and not to the kingdom of heaven, and that I should return to the service of my earthly master. For he who knoweth his master's will and doeth it not shall be beaten with many stripes and thus have I chastened you. And the Negroes found fault and murmured against me, saying if they had my sense, they would not serve any master in the world. And about this time, I had a vision. And I saw white spirits and black spirits engaged in battle. And the sun was darkened, the thunder rolled in the heavens, and blood flowed in streams. And I heard a voice saying, Such is your luck, such you are called to see, and let it come rough or smooth, you must surely bear it. I now withdrew myself as much as my situation would permit from the intercourse of my fellow servants for the avowed purpose of serving the spirit more fully 
and it appeared to me and reminded me of the things it had already shown me, and that it would then reveal to me the knowledge of the elements, the revolution of the planets, the operation of tides, and changes of the season. After this revelation in the year 1825, and the knowledge of the elements being made known to me, I sought more than ever to obtain true holiness before the great day of judgment should appear. And then I began to receive the true knowledge of faith. And from the first steps of righteousness until the last was I made perfect. And the Holy Ghost was with me and said, Behold me as I stand in the heavens, and I looked and saw the forms of men in different attitudes. And there were lights in the sky to which the children of darkness gave other names than what they really were. For they were the lights of the Savior's hands, stretched forth from east to west, even as they were extended on the cross on Calvary for the redemption of sinners. And I wondered greatly at these miracles, and prayed to be informed of a certainty of the meaning thereof, and shortly afterwards, while laboring in the fields, I discovered drops of blood on the corn, as though it was dew from heaven. And I communicated it to many, both white and black, in the neighborhood. And then I found on the leaves in the woods hieroglyphic characters and numbers with the forms of men in different attitudes portrayed in the blood and representing the figures I had before seen in the heavens. And now the Holy Ghost had revealed itself to me. For as the blood of Christ has been shed on this earth and had ascended to heaven for the salvation of sinners and was now returning to earth again in the form of dew, and as the leaves on the trees bore the impression of figures I had seen in the heavens, it was plain to me that the Savior was about to lay down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and the great day of judgment was at hand. About this time, I told these things to a white man, Ethelred T. Brantley, on whom it had a wonderful effect. And he ceased from his wickedness and was attacked immediately with a cutaneous eruption and blood oozed from the pores of his skin. And after praying and fasting nine days, he was healed. And the spirit appeared to me again and said, as the savior had been baptized, so should we be also. And when the white people would not let us be baptized by the church, we went down in the water together in the sight of many who reviled us and were baptized by the Spirit. After this, I rejoiced greatly and gave thanks to God. And on the 12th of May, 1828, I heard a loud noise in the heavens, and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosened, and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men, and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent. For the time was fast approaching when the first should be last, and the last should be first. Do you not find yourself mistaken now? Was not Christ crucified? And by signs in the heavens that it would make known to me when I should commence the great work, and until the first sign appeared, I should conceal it from the knowledge of men. And on the appearance of the sign, the eclipse of sun last February, I should arise and prepare myself and slay my enemies with their own weapons. And immediately on the sign appearing in the heavens, the seal was removed from my lips. And I communicated the great work laid out for me to do to four in whom I had the greatest confidence, Henry, Hark, Nelson, and Sam. It was intended by us to have begun the work of death on the 4th of July last. Many were the plans formed and rejected by us, and it affected my mind to such a degree that I felt sick, and the time passed without our coming to any determination how to commence still forming new schemes and rejecting them, when the sign appeared again, which determined me not to wait longer. Since the commencement of 1830, I had been living with Mr. Joseph Travis, 
who was to me a kind master, and placed the greatest confidence in me. In fact, I had no cause to complain of his treatment of me. On Saturday evening, the 20th of August, it was agreed between Henry, Hark, and myself to prepare a dinner the next day for the men we expected, and then to concert a plan, as we had not yet determined on any. Hark, on the following morning, brought a pig, and Henry, brandy, and being joined by Sam, Nelson, Will, and Jack, they prepared in the woods a dinner where, at about three o'clock, I joined them. Why were you so backward in joining them? The same reason that had caused me not to mix with them for years before. I saluted them on coming up and asked Will how came he there. He answered, his life was worth no more than others and his liberty as dear to him. I asked him if he thought to obtain it. He said he would or lose his life. This was enough to put him in full confidence. Jack, I knew, was only a tool in the hands of Hark. It was quickly agreed we should commence at home, Mr. J. Travis's, on that night. And until we had armed and equipped ourselves and gathered sufficient force, neither age nor sex was to be spared, which was invariably adhered to. We remained at the feast until about two hours in the night, when we went to the house and found Austin. They all went to the cider press and drank, except myself. On returning to the house, Hark went to the door with an ax for the purpose of breaking it open. As we know, we were strong enough to murder the family if they were awaked by the noise, but reflecting that it might create an alarm in the neighborhood, we determined to enter the house secretly and murder them while sleeping. Hark got a ladder and set it against the chimney on which I ascended, and hoisting a window entered and came downstairs, unbarred the door and removed the guns from their places. It was then observed that I must spill the first blood on which, armed with a hatchet and accompanied by will, I entered my master's chamber. It being dark, I could not give a death blow. The hatchet glanced from his head. He sprang from the bed and called his wife. It was his last word. Will laid him dead with a blow of his axe, and Mrs. Travis shared the same fate as she lay in bed. The murder of this family, five in number, was the work of a moment. Not one of them awoke. There was a little infant sleeping in a cradle that was forgotten until we had left the house and gone some distance, when Henry and Will returned and killed it. We got here four guns that would shoot and several old muskets with a pound or two of powder. We remained some time at the barn where we paraded. I formed them in a line as soldiers, and after carrying them through all the maneuvers I was master of, marched them off to Mr. Salothol Francis's, about 600 yards distant. Sam and Will went to the door and knocked. Mr. Francis asked who was there. Sam replied it was him, and he had a letter for him, on which he got up and came to the door. They immediately seized him, and dragging him out a little from the door, he was dispatched by repeated blows on the head. There was no other white person in the family. We started from there for Mrs. Reese's, maintaining the most perfect silence on our march, where, finding the door unlocked, we entered and murdered Mrs. Reese in her bed while sleeping. Her son awoke, but it was only to sleep the sleep of death. He had only time to say, who is that? And he was no more. From Mrs. Reese's, we went to Mrs. Turner's a mile distant, which we reached about sunrise on Monday morning. Henry, Austin, and Sam went to the still, where, finding Mr. Peebles, Austin shot him, and the rest of us went to the house. As we approached, the family discovered us and shut the door. Vain hope. Will, with one stroke of his axe, opened it and entered, and found Mrs. Turner and Mrs. Newsom in the middle of the room, almost frightened to death. Will immediately killed Mrs. Turner with one blow of his axe. I took Mrs. Newsom by the hand, and with the sword I had when I was apprehended, I struck her. As the sword was dull, Will, turning around and discovered it, dispatched her also. A general destruction of property and search for ammunition always succeeded the murders. By this time, my company amounted to 15, and nine men mounted who started for Mrs. Whitehead's. The other six were to go through a byway to Mr. Bryant's and rejoin us at Mrs. Whitehead's. 
As we approached the house, we discovered Mr. Richard Whitehead standing in the cotton patch near the lane fence. We called him over into the lane, and Will, the executioner, was near at hand with his fatal axe to send him to an untimely grave. As we pushed on to the house, I discovered someone running around the garden, and thinking it was some of the White family, I pursued them. But finding it was a servant girl belonging to the house, I returned to commence the work of death. But they whom I left had not been idle. All the family were already murdered, but Mrs. Whitehead and her daughter Margaret. As I came round to the door, I saw Will pulling Mrs. Whitehead out of the house and at the step he nearly severed her head from her body with his broad axe. Miss Margaret, when I discovered her, had concealed herself in the corner formed by the projection of the cellar cap from the house. On my approach she fled, but was soon overtaken, and after repeated blows with the sword, I killed her by a blow on the head with a fence rail. By this time, the six who had gone by Mr. Bryant's rejoined us and informed me that they had done the work of death assigned them. We again divided, part going on to Mr. Richard Porter's, and from thence to Nathaniel Francis's, the others to Mr. Howell Harris's and Mr. T. Doyle's. On my reaching Mr. Porter's, he had escaped with his family. I understood there that the alarm had already spread, and I immediately returned to bring up those sent to Mr. Doyle's and Mr. Howell Harris's the party I left going on to Mr. Francis's. Having told them I would join them in that neighborhood, I met those sent on to Mr. Doyle's and Mr. Harris's returning, having met Mr. Doyle on the road and killed him. And learning from some who joined them that Mr. Harris was from home, I immediately pursued the course taken by the party gone on before. But knowing they would complete the work of death and pillage at Mr. Francis's before I could get there, I went to Mr. Peter Edwards expecting to find them there, but they had been here also. I then went to Mr. John T. Barrows. They had been here and murdered him. I pursued on their track to Captain Newitt Harris's, where I found the greater part mounted and ready to start. The men now amounting to about 40 shouted and hurrahed as I rode up. Some were in the yard loading their guns, others drinking. They said Captain Harris and his family had escaped. The property in the house they destroyed, robbing him of money and other valuables. I ordered them to mount and march instantly. This was about nine or 10 o'clock Monday morning. I proceeded to Mr. Levi Waller's, two or three miles distant. I took my station in the rear, and as it was my object to carry terror and devastation wherever we went, I placed 15 or 20 of the best armed and most to be relied on in front who generally approached the houses as fast as their horses could run. This was for two purposes, to prevent the escape and strike terror to the inhabitants. On this account, I never got to the houses after leaving Mrs. Whitehead's until after the murders were committed, except in one case. I sometimes got in sight in time to see the work of death completed, viewed the mangled bodies as they lay in silent satisfaction, and immediately started in quest of other victims. Having murdered Mrs. Waller and 10 children, we started for Mr. William Williams, having killed him and two little boys that were there. While engaged in this, Mrs. Williams fled and got some distance from the house, but she was pursued, overtaken, and compelled to get up behind one of the company who brought her back. And after showing her the mangled body of her lifeless husband, she was told to get down and by his side where she was shot dead. I then started for Mr. Jacob Williams's, where the family were murdered. Here we found a young man named Drury who had come in on business with Mr. Williams. He was pursued, overtaken, and shot. Mrs. Vaughan's was the next place we visited, and after murdering the family here, I determined on starting for Jerusalem. Our number now amounting to 50 or 60, all mounted and armed with guns, axes, swords, and clubs. On reaching Mr. James W. Parker's gate, immediately on the road leading to Jerusalem, and about three miles distant, it was proposed to me to call there, but I objected, as I knew he was gone to Jerusalem, and my object was to reach there as soon as possible. 
but some of the men having relations at Mr. Parker's, it was agreed that they might call and get his people. I remained at the gate on the road with seven or eight, the others going across the field to the house about half a mile off. After waiting some time for them, I became impatient, started to the house for them, and on our return, we were met by a party of white men who had pursued our blood-stained track and who had fired on those at the gate and dispersed them, which I knew nothing of, not having been at that time rejoined by any of them. Immediately on discovering the whites, I ordered my men to halt and form, as they appeared to be alarmed. The white men, 18 in number, approached us within about 100 yards when one of them fired. This was against the positive orders of Captain Alexander P. Pete, who commanded and who directed the men to reserve their fire until within 30 paces, and discovered about half of them retreating. I then ordered my men to fire and rush on them. The few remaining stood their ground until we approached within 50 yards when they fired and retreated. We pursued and overtook some of them, who we thought we left dead. They were not killed. After pursuing them about 200 yards and rising a little hill, I discovered they were met by another party and had halted and were reloading their guns, thinking that those who retreated first and the party who fired on us at 50 or 60 yards distant had all fallen back to meet others with ammunition. As I saw them reloading their guns and more coming up than I saw at first, and several of my bravest men being wounded, the others became panic-struck and squandered over the field. The white men pursued and fired on us several times. Hark had his horse shot under him, and I caught another for him as it was running by me. Five or six of my men were wounded, but none left on the field. Finding myself defeated here, I instantly determined to go through a private way and cross the Nottoway River at the Cypress Bridge, three miles below Jerusalem, and attack that place in the rear. As I expected, they would look for me on the other road, and I had a great desire to get there to procure arms and ammunition. After going a short distance in this private way, accompanied by about 20 men, I overtook two or three who told me the others were dispersed in every direction. After trying in vain to collect a sufficient force to proceed to Jerusalem, I determined to return, as I was sure they would make back to their old neighborhood where they would rejoin me, make new recruits, and come down again. On my way back, I called at Mrs. Thomas's, Mrs. Spencer's, and several other places. The white families having fled, we found no more victims to gratify our thirst for blood. We stopped at Major Ridley's quarters for the night, and being joined by four of his men with the recruits made since my defeat, we mustered now about 40 strong. After placing out sentinels, I laid down to sleep, but was quickly roused by a great racket. Starting up, I found some mounted and others in great confusion. One of the sentinels having given the alarm that we were about to be attacked, I ordered some to ride round and reconnoiter, and on their return, the others being more alarmed, not knowing who they were, fled in different ways, so that I was reduced to about 20 again. With this, I determined to attempt to recruit and to proceed to rally in the neighborhood I had left. Dr. Blunt's was the nearest house, which we reached just before day. On riding up the yard, Hawk fired a gun. We expected Dr. Blunt and his family were at Major Ridley's. As I knew there was a company of men there, the gun was fired to ascertain if any of the family were at home. We were immediately fired upon and retreated, leaving several of my men. I do not know what became of them, as I never saw them afterwards. Pursuing our course back and coming in sight of Captain Harris's where we had been the day before, we discovered a party of white men at the house, on which all deserted me but two, Jacob and Nat. We concealed ourselves in the woods until near night, when I sent them in search of Henry, Sam, Nelson, and Hark, and directed them to rally all they could at the place we had had our dinner the Sunday before, where they would find me, and I accordingly returned there as soon as it was dark and remained until Wednesday evening, when discovering white men riding around the place as though they were looking for someone, and none of my men joining me, I concluded Jacob and Nat had been taken and compelled to betray me. 
On this, I gave up all hope for the present. And on Thursday night, after having supplied myself with provisions from Mr. Travis's, I scratched a hole under a pile of fence rails in a field where I concealed myself for six weeks, never leaving my hiding place but for a few minutes in the dead of night to get water, which was very near. Thinking by this time I could venture out, I began to go about in the night and eavesdrop the houses in the neighborhood, pursuing this course for about a fortnight, and gathering little or no intelligence, afraid of speaking to any human being, and returning every morning to my cave before the dawn of day. I know not how long I might have led this life if accident had not betrayed me. A dog in the neighborhood passing by my hiding place one night while I was out was attracted by some meat I had in my cave and crawled in and stole it and was coming out just as I returned. A few nights after, two Negroes having started to go hunting with the same dog and passing that way, the dog came again to the place and having just gone out to walk about, discovered me and barked, on which, thinking myself discovered, I spoke to them to beg concealment. On making myself known, they fled from me. Knowing then they would betray me, I immediately left my hiding place and was pursued almost incessantly until I was taken a fortnight afterwards by Mr. Benjamin Phipps in a little hole I had dug out with my sword for the purpose of concealment under the top of a fallen tree. On Mr. Phipps's discovering the place of my concealment, he cocked his gun and aimed at me. I requested him not to shoot, and I would give up, upon which he demanded my sword. I delivered it to him, and he brought me to prison. During the time I was pursued, I had many hairbreadth escapes, which your time will not permit me to relate. I am here loaded with chains and willing to suffer the fate that awaits me. The Commonwealth versus Nat Turner. Charged with making insurrection and plotting to take away the lives of divers, free white persons, and so forth on the 22nd of August, 1831. The court having met for the trial of Nat Turner, the prisoner was brought in and arraigned, and upon his arraignment pleaded, not guilty, saying to his counsel that he did not feel so. On the part of the Commonwealth, Levi Waller was introduced, who being sworn, deposed agreeable to Nat's own confession. Colonel Tresvant, the committing magistrate, was then introduced, who, being sworn, numerated Nat's confession to him as given. The prisoner introduced no evidence, and the case was submitted without argument to the court, who, having found him guilty, Jeremiah Cobb, Esquire Chairman, pronounced the sentence of the court in the following words. Nat Turner, stand up. Have you anything to say why sentence of death should not be pronounced against you? I have not. I have made a full confession to Mr. Gray, and I have nothing more to say. Attend, then, to the sentence of the court. You have been arraigned and tried before this court and convicted of one of the highest crimes in our criminal code. You have been convicted of plotting in cold blood the indiscriminate destruction of men, of helpless women, and of infant children. The evidence before us leaves us not a shadow of a doubt but that your hands were often imbued in the blood of the innocent, and your own confession tells us that they were stained with the blood of a master, in your own language, too indulgent. Could I stop here, your crime would be sufficiently aggravated. But the original contriver of a plan, deep and deadly, one that can never be effected, you managed so far to put it into execution as to deprive us of many of our most valuable citizens. And this was done when they were asleep and defenseless under circumstances shocking to humanity. And while upon this part of the subject, I cannot but call your attention to the poor misguided wretches who have gone before you. They are not few in number. They were your bosom associates, and the blood of all cries aloud and calls upon you as the author of their misfortune. Yes, you force them unprepared from time to eternity. Borne down by this load of guilt, your only justification is that you were led away by fanaticism. If this be true, from my soul I pity you. 
And while you have my sympathies, I am nevertheless called upon to pass the sentence of the court. The time between this and your execution will necessarily be very short, and your only hope must be in another world. The judgment of the court is that you be taken hence to the jail from whence you came, thence to the place of execution, and on Friday next, between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., be hung by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. And may the Lord have mercy upon your soul. Brother Peters, having heard your reading of uh, the confessions of Nat Turner, I wonder if you would uh, enlighten us on whether indeed you felt that you were reading the confessions of Nat Turner or the confessions of um, Thomas Gray, who recorded uh, Nat Turner's confessions, whether you felt Gray's intrusion upon uh, the confessions. At what point did you feel that Nat Turner was being uh, interpreted by Gray, or over-interpreted, or intruded upon by Gray? Well, I have just concluded reading them, and it would be difficult for me to go back to the point at which I uh, uh, definitely was sure of Thomas Gray's intrusion. Uh, one of the points that I can certainly remember is uh, the use of the term murder, as Gray gave it, to uh, Nat Turner. And it is here that I have grave doubts that uh, Nat Turner would have used the term murder given the enlightenment he had come to through his life. Uh, I think he would have known that the term murder is a legal term which uh, indicates guilt. And if in fact he was the dedicated man that uh, history indicates, he could not have used the term murder. He might have done as any heroes in, in, our, in man's history have done. And they have used terms destroy or kill or slaughter. Uh, but they've never acceded to or admitted the term murder. And at this point, I felt that uh, there was the effort to interpret or to perhaps influence those who would in future or immediately thereafter read the confessions. Uh, the other point that disturbed me greatly, uh, that comes readily to mind, is uh, there seemed to be, for me, uh, an, a great effort on the part of uh, Gray, or an excessive uh, dealing with the religious. Now, it may well have been that Nat Turner was religious, uh, but Gray's leaning so heavily on the religious seemed to me an attempt to allay the fears of the white community of the time so that they could feel that this was a religious fanatic and not indeed a man who was capable of the power of logical, concentrated uh, thought, uh, a pragmatist, if you wish, uh, that in fact there might be others like him. Uh, and I feel this again as an intrusion by Thomas Gray. I'd like to know from Dr. Abtecker, who is a historian who has written a major work on the Nat Turner uh, rebellion, who exactly was Nat Turner and what is his significance for today? We uh, know a uh, fairly good deal about uh, Nat Turner and his rebellion. There were, of course, many conspiracies and many rebellions. The unique thing about the Turner one is the very considerable documentation which exists. When Turner was executed, he was a man of 31 years. He uh, was born and uh, raised in this Tidewater County of Virginia, Southampton County, which had uh, a very considerable slave population, slightly in excess of the white population. And, uh, by the way, a considerable, relatively considerable, free Negro population. It had been a county where many Quakers had lived, but most of them had moved out uh, by about 1810. Now, uh, Turner was um, a slave, as were hundreds of thousands of others. Uh, he seems to have been more gifted uh, than uh, 
many of his neighbors and friends and fellow slaves. He also uh, clearly had uh, a family life and uh, uh, knew his father, knew his mother, knew his grandmother, and uh, they influenced him. His father had uh, run away from slavery and uh, made it, uh, stayed away successfully. Now, uh, Turner is um, clearly, of course, a product of his status as a slave and his times. The, the times are one of economic depression, uh, a massive development of the anti-slavery movement in Britain, slave uprisings in the West Indies, which were reported, the beginning of the so-called Negro Convention movement, the first national one, 1830, David Walker's great uh, cry for freedom, published in 1829 and circulated in the South, the appearance of the Liberator, the first number in January 1831, so that uh, he, uh, his rebellion of August 1831 comes in this period uh, of economic depression, of great political uh, turmoil and uh, risings, so that, by the way, the whole slave uh, suppression machinery was intensified by the masters in this period. The uh, federal forts were reinforced in Virginia and Louisiana in the spring of 1831. New laws of repression were passed uh, beginning about 1829. Um, now, uh, Mr. Peters mentioned the religiosity of Turner, but actually, of course, uh, this religiosity was pretty universal at that period, uh, not only in the South, among slaves and uh, non-slaves and masters, uh, so that this kind of thinking, uh, kind of uh, rhetoric, uh, was uh, perfectly conventional in the South and in the North. Um, I might remark in connection with this and the authenticity of this uh, pamphlet, which was published in 1831, that the masters didn't like it, and uh, they suppressed it. They, uh, the police uh, went after it and burned it and destroyed it. It's a very rare pamphlet now. There are only three or four copies of the original printing. It, it was reprinted later, but uh, uh, so that uh, uh, whatever intrusion there was, and no doubt verbally there was, uh, the, the essential authenticity uh, comes through. And, of course, Turner's insistence on his uh, not being guilty and this tremendous line where, chained to the walls of a Virginia jail and about to be hanged, he says to the face of the white man, was not Christ crucified? This uh, is simply a shattering kind of thing. Well, that, that's something of, uh, of uh, Nat Turner, I think. I'm trying to see Nat Turner's uh, rebellion in context with his period. Um, some writers tend to indicate that it was a rebellion that was born in isolation, and I seem to maintain that the period was rebellious and that the atmosphere of rebellion was so prevalent around him he could have pulled stimuli from the age he lived in. And, uh, it is this uh, that we we like to, to look into because the Haitian Revolution had already occurred and other slave revolutions had already occurred, and surely he must have known about them. Well, we can conjecture that he did. Of course, there is no way to be certain he did, but you are quite right, uh, absolutely, uh, in the point you are making in this sense. Uh, the slave rebellions here came in waves. Um, and, uh, for instance, 1790-182 is one such wave. Now, 1827-1832 is another such wave. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why, for instance, as I said, uh, the state of Louisiana and the state of Virginia reinforced its machinery of repression, mm -hmm. and why the Secretary of War sent more troops down, and why they passed more laws of repression, uh, very much like uh, uh, now that the summer of 1968 is about to appear, you have all sorts of advocates of uh, repression and tanks and mace and God knows what else. It was not dissimilar in uh, 1829, 30, and 31. 
And there were several conspiracies and uh, uprisings. The original reports of the Turner Rebellion in the contemporary press stated that they assumed this rebellion was one of a series of outbreaks that had marked the Tidewater region and particularly forays by Maroons in the Great Dismal Swamp, which is in Southampton County, which had been disturbing the slave-holding class. Uh, so that from that point of view, contemporaries themselves, I mean the white press, mm -hmm. uh, thought that the Turner Rebellion was simply another in a whole series of such rebellions in this period. So you are quite right, absolutely, no question about it, that this was in the context, mm -hmm. internationally as well as nationally, of uh, rising unrest uh, of the slave population. I'm intrigued by the word maroon because the largest slave revolt in Jamaica was led by the, um, uh, by the maroons. And um, further, I'd like to go into, I have both you and Brock go into the, the contemporary significance of uh, the interpretation of, uh, of, of Nat Turner and why the uh, prevailing interpretation in a popular novel is so contrary to the historical documents relating to Nat Turner. Could we be reading a contemporary fear into a 19th century situation? Is it, that's exactly the reason I referred to the religiosity in the first place. I felt that uh, given the fact that perhaps Nat Turner gave a negative answer to Thomas Gray, uh, about uh, the connection of the rebellion that he had led with any others, the possible connection with others. Uh, Turner was probably, uh, uh, that is, Gray was probably not satisfied. For me, in reading the uh, document, uh, I, I felt that Gray interpreted heavily on the side of, of mystique, mystical things, of, of metaphysical things of religious rather than uh, the clear cold uh, planning that must have gone into this and is evidenced by uh, what Nat says about uh, meeting with the, the men he met with. They're sitting and talking over the dates and disagreeing about the time and then finally coming to a decision based on uh, certain holidays, etc. Uh, there had to have been co cold thinking and planning in this, and uh, driven by their desire to be free, the honorable, the great desire to, of all men to be free. But uh, am I wrong in, in feeling that this is, uh, there was an effort by Gray to, to play that down and to play up the religious so that people would feel that uh, out of religion, out of a kind of fanaticism, out of a kind of mystical thing, uh, this had happened, and not out of uh, the kind of ri that they had not, in fact, to deal with men who could think as they did at their level. Well, I, I would say this. Uh, I think that the contemporary usage of these kinds of symbols uh, in the contemporary work uh, to which uh, John uh, had reference uh, does this today. Hmm. But I do not think that that uh, was present then. Uh, I say that, again, uh, for example, the very symbols that affected uh, Nat, the uh, green hue in the sky, was noticed contemporaneously and was talked about in the press, and the eclipse uh, was, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, a congregation south of Canal Street in New York was told by its minister that this meant the world would end south of Canal Street, so the congregation moved north of Canal Street. Uh, that's in New York City. That was, this is a white uh, congregation. Uh, that's the time. And uh, it, uh, the uh, symbolism, in fact, is perfectly natural, and his saying was not Christ crucified, and so on. And then, of course, you recall John Brown, who was, uh, who was filled with this. That's the time. It's, it's the pre-Civil War America, which is a highly religious uh, society. Mm -hmm. And the verbiage was this. But the practicality of the verbiage, what it meant, and uh, the reality of vengeance and retribution and justice and so on, uh, is uh, quite real. 
Now, it can, of course, be falsified in a secular age, such as we now live in, mm -hmm. in which these kinds of references sound fanatical or silly or something, you see, but not there. So uh, I would suggest that that's uh, very real, very now, real. Nat Turner has always been a hero to all of his people who knew of his um, exploits. In the uh, current work on Nat Turner, he appears to be less than a hero. In fact, he vacillates between being a revolutionist and an Uncle Tom. Uh, once more, I think uh, a contemporary use is being made of uh, Nat Turner's personality in order to counteract or downgrade certain uh, uh, living personalities of revolutionary intent. Uh, did you feel any of this in the, uh, in the contemporary work and uh, in the speech of, uh, of Nat Turner? I kept feeling that this was a 19th century speech, black or white, mm. that men of the 19th century didn't speak this way. Black men of the 19th century didn't speak this way. Nor did white men of the 19th century speak this way. Uh, well, I, I think that's uh, probably true. Um, I, I don't pretend to be an expert on, uh, on language and speech in this sense. I found it uh, forced. But I think uh, what I'm more confident in is the character of Nat, the real character. Now, he was never broken, for example. He never doubted himself or his cause, not for a minute. And when he went to his death, the contemporary press noted, this is, of course, the white press, the contemporary press noted that he went to his death calmly. They say so. Uh, he says uh, to the court, uh, I'm not guilty because I don't feel guilty. Uh, he says to the interrogator, was not Christ crucified? He never breaks for a moment. Uh, he is a uh, hero in the heroic mold which uh, all people who have been oppressed, uh, Irish or Jewish or Polish or Russian or German, whatever they are, have produced. This Turner is a giant, a remarkable figure in the... Uh, record of a human struggle against indignity and for full equality. Uh, any work which uh, denigrates from that in any way or makes him uh, doubt, you know, did I do the right thing, and so on, is quite contrary to everything we have in the contemporary record. I would like for both you and Brock to answer very briefly whether indeed it is in your opinion that Nat Turner still waits for his proper interpreter? If I may answer first, I think uh, I can answer in the affirmative. He still does wait, uh, as do most of the citizens of this country and the rest of the world who, who uh, from the non-Caucasian populations, mm -hmm who want to see, who need their heroes, and uh, not only for themselves, but uh, the larger, the more universal reason to, for, so that they may join the ranks of heroes that, that already exists, the panoply of heroes that, uh, that have been mounted before us uh, right along, and there are black men among them, and uh, it is time that we, in fact, dealt with one, honestly. Um. I uh, agree uh, very much. I, I would like to say that um, uh, the very distinguished uh, Negro scholar Anna Bontom in 1936 did uh, a first-rate novel on another great black hero, Gabriel. The book is called Black Thunder. Uh, that didn't sell very well, by the way, and was soon out of print. Uh, but uh, it's a uh, fine book. And um, if we could get anything approximating that uh, for Turner, we'd have a beginning. I, I want to say again, uh, just think if you could get a person with the genius of, uh, of Brecht or uh, of Gorky or uh, old Richard Wright uh, when he was at his best, or Du Bois when he was at his best, to do a play on Turner. And to have that scene, was not Christ crucified, it seems to me you could just bring an audience, uh, I don't know, just leaping to the ceiling if you did it right with a comprehension of what this meant in terms of a black man doing this in Virginia in 1831, chained to the wall and about to be hanged the next day. 
I mean, it, it's just hair-raising. It's, it's fantastic in terms of heroism and in terms of symbolism, in terms of meaning. If you could get that across, it'd be a terrific thing in terms of the racism in this country, the meaning of it. So yes, we uh, desperately need that kind of an artistic production. The writer Lerone Bennett, in an essay on Nat Turner, has said, the prophet who died in the Jerusalem of America, cool and calm, sure of the black reconstruction, still awaits a literary interpreter worthy of his sacrifice. He still awaits an interpreter who will not deal himself out of the game, an interpreter who is prepared to give something and to give up something, an interpreter who recognizes that the rope has two ends and that you have to bring a man to find a man. But we uh, seem to have come to the end of our uh, very interesting discussion, uh, Mr. Peters. And John, uh, John Clark, I want to thank you very much for having me here. I've enjoyed it a great deal.